be here this morning. Um, you're extremely welcome. I don't know if you're a visitor, you're especially welcome to our service this morning. I'm um, the Lord will bless us all to meet together. Uh, this day, I want to uh, welcome our feature this morning, uh, Reverend Rick Kisman. We've been with us on Keith before, uh, but we always look forward to him coming. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to what you're bringing to us this morning, and you're extremely welcome. Uh, with us here this morning. Uh, this evening's service will be led by Andy Eves. And then on Tuesday, just to remind the administration team that we're meeting at, at 7 30. Uh, that's the team from out of the committee. 7 30 on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday evening, we have our time of prayer at 8 o'clock. I would encourage you to come and join with us at that time on Wednesday evening. Especially during this time of vacancy, when we really do need corporate prayer to guide us to the future of, of our church here. So please come and join us on Wednesday evening. Um, Craig will uh, lead that time of prayer. Uh, please remember the free food fed Friday. Uh, if you're able to bring stuff to the table, as I said, please bring it on a Sunday and leave it in the shopping trolley in the festive group. Uh, and then next Sunday, our morning service again will be led by Brewer Kisman, uh, so please come and join us then. From next Sunday on, during July and August, there will be no evening service. Uh, session of the Senate in their wisdom just to uh, cancel evening services for July and August. So but please, uh, remember, uh, if, when you're at home, just think there will be shooting meeting. Um, if you don't go to another church, but please remember the service of Raven Hill on our people here. Uh, also, uh, could I ask anyone who needs to serve some minister, uh, please contact myself uh, if at all possible up until Thursday. From Thursday on, please contact Clive. I will be away for the next two Sundays. So uh, if you contact Clive, if you land one needs a service of the minister. I think that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, I would now ask Craig to come up and make a special announcement. Morning everyone. Good, morning. Good to see you all. Uh, just before I do that, I just wanted to share with you first that I read this morning. And it encouraged me and I hope it, hopefully it will encourage you. It's from Psalm 5 and it says this. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. And uh, so I thought that was a real special verse. We're going to sing for joy very shortly. And uh, at this time where we are in transition, we're very much in need of God's hand of protection and guidance over us. And um, so one of the important things at this time is to remain united and another important thing is not to stand still so those of you who have been through vacancy before and some of you i know have been through it uh, a number of times and uh, it's a time you know where we must very much uh, turn to god and look for his guidance but one thing that i just want you to think and pray pray about First of all, a couple of things that are coming up very soon. The Young Life Day Camp, which will be held in the church halls here, starts on the 3rd of July, and that's running for a week. And that was a really special time last year with the American team coming over. So I want you to uh, remember the teens uh, in, in our church and in our community. Uh, at the end of July, we're having a holiday Bible club and with a PCI team coming to lead that and Josh is, is heading that up from the Raven Hill point of view. Now one of the things we'll be doing, there's going to be a small team put together, we're going to go out into the community uh, to visit our GB and our BB families in the primary schools to try and build up uh, not only the, the uh, Holiday Bible Club but also Shine for September. So there's something maybe you might consider. Uh, if you're interested uh, and getting involved in that, either see Josh, he'll be back this week, or me. Um, 
One area again where there's going to be a real need come September is our girls' brigade. A fantastic group of girls in the girls' brigade. Those of you who went to display will have seen that. And uh, we've lost two leaders, so we really do need a couple of leaders for GB. Um, I'm going to get Stacey over the next couple of weeks, hopefully, to, to tell you a wee bit about what that involves. Todson Company, which is our mother and chip uh, toddlers, there's another area uh, where uh, we're going to need one or two helpers uh, come September. So maybe if that's you, Thursday morning for an hour or two, that you might be able to lend a hand on that one. Um, again, if you speak to Dennis about that, and um, we'll, we'll certainly take that forward. The Friday food table, there's another area we're covered now in September, but again, if that's something that might interest you. And one other thing that we're going to hopefully restart is our minibus outreach into the community, you know, to bring the children on a, on a Sunday. COVID absolutely destroyed that. That takes a lot of people, both drivers and helpers, so there'll be more about that again. Pray over that. And finally, and most importantly, uh, if, if your inclination is more to visiting the sick or those who are shut in, pastoral care, again, that is something. I know some people just do that quietly in their own time, that's fantastic. But if that's something that maybe you feel a calling to do, um, speak to Dennis or speak to one of the elders, um, and we would we'll be very grateful uh, for your help. So, with loads of areas of service here, could come up. We're going to have a sign up sheet, uh, sign up Sunday coming up in the next couple of weeks. But I want you to pray over over that and how maybe you could be involved. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, it's uh, lovely to be here this morning. Um, as one lady said to me on the way in, you're Paddy's dad. So. Um, if you don't know me in any other way, that's who I am. Uh, but um, it's good to be able to meet together to worship God, to remember what it is that unites us, especially as we meet um, around his table later on. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As we meet in church today to remember the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're celebrating that something that many people in our world think is ridiculous or irrelevant. But for us who believe, the cross shows the wonder of God's love and grace to us and his amazing power at work. We're going to sing of that in our opening praise. O church, arise, where in verse 3 we sing of the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Let's stand and praise God together.
I think most of you are around here um, for now. <coughs> I just want to think about for a moment about a special day that all of us have every year, but it's not the same day for us all. Can you think about what that day might be? Yeah. Birthday, well done, yeah. So, anybody got a birthday anytime soon? When's yours? Okay, that's pretty soon. Yeah, that's coming up pretty soon. Um, what are some of the good things about birthdays? Cake, yeah, cake's brilliant, isn't it? It's nice to have cake on your birthday. Anything else? Presents, Presents yeah. Uh, we'll be hoping for a few of those as well. <laughs> um, and sometimes we have a party with friends, isn't that right? We kind of celebrate. What is it we're celebrating? Yeah. The day we were born, that's right, yeah. Do you remember that day? No, I'm sure you don't. Um, but there's there's at least one person who will remember that day very well. Um, <clears throat> but um, we're celebrating the day that we were born. We're kind of looking back. We can't remember that day. We know that there was a day, because we're alive now, so we know that there was a day when we were born. And we're celebrating that day on our birthdays, kind of looking back to that day. We're also giving thanks for the fact that we are alive um, and for all the good things that we have. So we're, we're giving thanks right now for <clears throat> the life that God has given to us um, and the number of years that we have been alive. Today in church, we're going to be doing something. It's not like a birthday celebration, but it is something special as we meet at this table for communion. And at communion, we're looking back. Now, we're not looking back to a birthday. We're looking back to something that in some ways seems quite sad. What are we looking back to at communion, do you think? Something that Jesus did. <clears throat> Wasn't the day that he was born, it was the day that he died, that's right, yes. Yeah. So at communion we're remembering the day that Jesus died on the cross for us because of the wrong things that we have done, how Jesus took the punishment for that. But Jesus wants us to look back to that because that is actually a really good thing. Because, because of the death of Jesus on the cross, we can have another birthday. We can come to God and say sorry to him for the wrong things that we have done. And in the Bible that talks about us being born again, like having a second birthday as being in God's family and adopted as his children. And that's one of the things that we can remember as we meet to have communion together, how God wants to bring us into his family, how he wants to give us like a second birthday <clears throat> as he makes us his children and accepts us to be with him forever. Because there's another bit about communion, which is all about looking forward to what's going to be like the best party ever. <clears throat> when one day Jesus comes back to this world and he takes those who love him, who are trusting in him, who are his friends, to be with him in a perfect new world. And the Bible talks about that, that like it's an amazing celebration, better than any birthday party anyone has ever had, when we are going to be with God forever. And one of the other things that we do as we meet uh, and have communion is we remember that there's something even better going to happen one day when we go to live with God in a perfect new world forever. And that's all possible because of the death of Jesus for us. That's why it's so special to do this, to remember, to look back, but also then to look forward to all that God promises us as his children and as his friends. Okay, okay before the uh, kids go out to shine, we're going to sing together. Um, um, we're going to sing Reach Up High. <clears throat>
we've seen in Mark uh, chapter 14, uh, where Jesus celebrates this uh, Last Supper with his disciples. Um, so if you'd like to turn to Mark 14, uh, we're going to read from verse 12 to 26. It's on page 102 of the Pew Bibles. Mark 14, and we remember that this is God's word. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. And we give thanks to God for his word. Before we come to look at those verses in a little bit more detail, we're going to sing it once more, all at once held dear.
us pray and ask for his help. Father, we thank you that this is your living word to us today. We're conscious that there are many things that can distract us, many ways in which we can fail to take this word to heart. But we pray against those, and we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit now, that you will come and that you will speak clearly to us, that you will do us good, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. How often do you get time to reflect on your life, where you're heading, how it's going, what you should be doing? Many of us probably feel that uh, reflection is a luxury. We love to be able to sit and contemplate, but there's work to be done. Children to be fed, a house to clean, a car to wash, emails to be answered, shopping to do, box sets to watch, I don't know. So one day rushes on into the next, and we're left with very little time to think. Or perhaps there are some of us who have too much time to reflect on our lives. And as we do, perhaps we feel a little bit better about how life has gone, or we wonder how it is that we've managed to end up with so much time and so little to fill it. And we tend to dwell on other trivial things that get blown up out of all proportion. Well, this service today gives us an opportunity to reflect, not only as we uh, look at this passage together, but as we come to the sacrament of communion. That's why I'd like to encourage us to make the most of the time that we have here, when no one is putting any other pressures on us or making demands of us. Because part of what we do as we uh, meet around this table is that we have an opportunity to reflect, to reflect on God himself, but also to reflect on ourselves, our lives, and what God has done and wants to do for us. Let's not forget, however, that this sacrament is not just a personal, individualistic experience. It's actually a way of demonstrating to others what is at the heart of our faith and what it is that unites us. We're going to be focusing this morning on what Mark has to say, about what we often refer to as the Lord's Supper. Um, and it would be helpful if you uh, were to turn back to Mark chapter 14 in your Bibles as we uh, work through these verses together to see what it is that God is saying from his word. Often this meal that, the, that Jesus has with his disciples is called the Last Supper because it was the last time that Jesus shared a meal with his disciples before his death. And yet in many ways it was a first supper because Jesus began something that has been carried on by Christians down through the centuries. And even though people may be confused as to its meaning and significance, it's something that in many ways has not changed very much over the centuries. The practicalities may vary a little from place to place, church to church, but it always involves bread and wine being shared by Christians as they remember together the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that means. And there are three time frames that I want to suggest that should be in our minds, both when we take part in the sacraments and indeed more generally when we think of the death of Christ. The first thing I want us to remember from these verses is that the Lord's Supper is a time to look back. The Lord's Supper is a time to look back. We're going to focus mainly on that, so don't panic when it seems a long time before we get to point two. The first thing is that the Lord's Supper is a time to look back. <clears throat> now we'll see as we look at these points together that although they applied to the disciples, um, they didn't apply in exactly the same way as they do to us now. For the disciples, as they ate this meal with Jesus, it was a time to look back, but what they were looking back to was different from what we look back to. You see, we have to remember that the account that we're reading here in Mark 14 is not just some great new idea that Jesus had, or some casual dinner that took on a deeper significance once it became clear that it was his last meal with his followers. We can see from verses 12 to 17, now what Jesus and his disciples were celebrating was the Feast of the Passover, a festival that dated right back to the time when the Israelites were delivered from death in Egypt and brought out of slavery. Back in Exodus chapter 12, we read about the first Passover meal, eaten on the night before the Israelites left Egypt. And 15 years later, here we see Jesus, or 1500 years later, here we see Jesus and his disciples doing what 
tens of thousands of Jews would have been doing throughout Jerusalem that same evening as they met together to remember the way that God had saved their ancestors and had brought them out of Egypt. By the time of Jesus, it would have been standard practice that the Passover should be celebrated in Jerusalem. And that's why so many people descended on the city at that time. And it's why Jesus needs to come back into the city from Bethany, where he's been staying. What we have to remember, though, is that Jesus hasn't been making too many friends among the Jewish religious leaders. And he knows that they are intent on killing him. But the time is not yet ready for that to happen. He needs to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And that's why we have this slightly unusual account in verses 12 to 16 of the preparations for the Passover. Two of the disciples going in advance of Jesus and the others to meet a man carrying a water pot and deliver a set speech to him. Now perhaps you've heard it said that this incident shows Jesus' supernatural power and insight that he could tell that there would be a man at a certain place who would be carrying a water pot, which was the kind of thing that generally only women did, and that this man would automatically allow the disciples to use his room if he knew that the teacher wanted it. And that is possible, but I'm not sure if we need to go that far. It's equally possible that Jesus had already met this man and had arranged for the use of his room and had determined these signs and messages so that the disciples could go ahead of him and make the preparations for the meal and then allow Jesus simply to turn up under cover of darkness when he wouldn't be so easily noticed coming back into the city and everything would then be ready. What matters more from these verses is not whether or not Jesus has supernatural powers and displays them at this point, but more the fact that he is in complete control of all that happens. That's something that Mark keeps emphasizing in his gospel. So that we understand that the death of Jesus wasn't a case of things getting a bit out of control, but it happened because he willingly gave himself up to death at the time of his choosing. And so the scene is set for Jesus to celebrate with his disciples. A meal that looked back to the time when the angel of death passed over the, uh, every home in Egypt <clears throat> where the sign of blood was over the doors because the Israelites had sacrificed a lamb and that protected them from the death of the firstborn. The firstborn of every Egyptian in every Egyptian household died but the firstborn in every Israelite household lived because a death had already taken place. There had been a substitute for the firstborn that should have died. That all, of course, though, pointed forward to a need for a better substitute. The whole sacrificial system that was instituted uh, after the Israelites uh, left Egypt and came uh, into the wilderness and subsequently into the land that God had promised, pointed ahead to the fact that sin is a problem. Death has to happen. God is angry with that. And animals were killed as substitutes. But they weren't the perfect substitute. The perfect substitute would be a human being who didn't need to die, being the ultimate sacrificial lamb who could atone for the sin of the world. And so for the disciples, as they celebrated this meal, they were looking forward to that perfect sacrifice that would one day come. And Jesus stuns them, if you like, at this point by telling them that that's now about to happen. He does it at two points in the meal. The first is when he takes the bread and he substitutes different words for the ones that were always used at the Passover. When the bread was handed out at Passover, they said the words, This is the bread of affliction, which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. But Jesus doesn't say that. Instead, he hands the bread round and says, as you can see in verse 22, Take it, this is my body. Clearly pointing ahead to some way in which his body would be broken and offered up. 
Now everyone wants, wants to dwell on the question of whether Jesus' actual body is in some way present in the bread when Christians celebrate communion. Except to say two things. The first is very simply that part of Jesus' body, his hands, was holding out this bread as he spoke. So it would be kind of strange to say this has now become my body for you. The second is that in the Passover meal, when the Jewish father said to his family, this is the bread of affliction, which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt, he didn't mean that the bread was hundreds of years old and had been preserved since the time of the Exodus. It represented the bread that was eaten in Egypt. And if that is the context in which Jesus is speaking, then surely it's safest for us to conclude that he means that this bread that we share together is to be representative of his body rather than being his actual body. But Jesus doesn't stop with the bread. He goes on to surprise his disciples again when it comes to the wine. Now there were only four cups of wine drunk in the Passover meal. They each had a symbolic meaning. And Jesus probably says the words that are recorded in verse 24 at the time when the third cup was being drunk. This cup <clears throat> was known as the cup of redemption. And as this cup is handed round, he says, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Jesus is the one who will ultimately redeem people, buying them back from slavery to sin and the devil, to serve the God who made them and who is their rightful master. But in speaking of the covenant, he's also reminding his disciples that God had made a promise to bring his people back to himself. You see, after God saved the Israelites and brought them out of Egypt, he made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. You probably think of that simply as the time he gave them the Ten Commandments. But they were part of an agreement by God that he would be the God of the Israelites and would prosper them, provided they kept his laws. And yet, as we know, that never really happened. Because, like all human beings, the Israelites were incapable of keeping God's laws perfectly. And they kept wandering away from him. If it was left to men and women to satisfy God's requirements by their own best efforts, they were going to fail every time. And so through prophets, like the prophet Jeremiah, God says things like these words in Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. There he says, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the land to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. Part of that covenant involved them obeying God, and they didn't obey him perfectly. They broke my covenant, says God, even though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, talking now about the new covenant he's going to make. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. <clears throat> and this is what God is going to do. He says in verse 33 of Jeremiah 31, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sin no more. Now what God's talking about is something that is not humanly possible. He's talking about our having our hearts and wills so changed that we will automatically know what it is that pleases God and we will instinctively do that all the time. And that's something that will only fully happen when this life is over. We cannot have that instinctive knowledge and perfect obedience now. But in those verses in Jeremiah, God is also talking about forgiving our wickedness, which is something we can experience now. And yet, if he's to remain a just and holy God, he can't sweep it under the carpet and pretend it hasn't happened. He can only forgive us if the price of our sin has been paid, if the punishment for it has been taken. And that's why the blood of Jesus is so vital to this new covenant. The blood of Jesus means that the covenant can take effect. And I can be forgiven, not because of anything that I have done, but because Jesus has died 
in my place. He has died the death that I deserved. He has experienced the full force of the wrath of God that should have been directed at me. And he did that so that God could forgive me for my despicable treatment of him. And so that God could keep his covenant and ultimate, ultimately make me someone that I could never become by myself. Now for Jesus' disciples, this meaning that they were sharing together didn't have this kind of significance at the point they were celebrating it. They're probably a little bit bewildered as to what's going on. But for us, the meaning is clear. For us, the Lord's Supper is a time to look back, not to the Passover, or even really to that Last Supper in the upper room. What we look back to is the cross. Because unlike the disciples, we know exactly how it was that Christ's body was given for us. And how his blood was poured out as he hung on that cross. Abandoned by those he loved, despised by the fickle crowd, suffering extreme physical pain. But worse than all of that, enduring the torment of hell and experiencing for the only time ever what it was like to feel the full force of God's righteous anger. This meal that we share together, this sacrament that we share together, is a time for us to look back to all that Christ did as he gave himself on the cross. But this is also, as it was for the disciples, a time to look in. That's the second thing I want us to uh, remember more briefly, that the Lord's Supper is a time to look in and examine our own hearts. That's what he asked his disciples to do, because in verse 18, Jesus reveals a shocking truth to them that one of them will betray him. And as he speaks, he makes it very clear how horrendous this is, because this is someone who's been in his intimate circle of friends, who's now going to betray him. In verse 18, you can see that he says, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And then in verse 12, 20, he says, it is one of the twelve, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. He's emphasizing that this is someone who has been incredibly close to him, who will ultimately betray him. And let's not forget how awful a thing this is, because sharing a meal together was a really big thing um, in the culture of Jesus' day. It counted for a lot more than it does today. And as Jesus says this, it prompts a serious bout of soul-searching among his disciples. It's one by one, they say to him, surely not I. And the way they put the question, it's as if they're looking for reassurance that I'm not the one, am I, who could be capable of such treachery? They want Jesus to say, don't worry, it's not you, you could never do that. And yet the fact that they have to ask him shows that they have enough self-awareness to realise that this is not something that they can dismiss as completely out of the question. And that looking in is something that should apply to us when we reflect on the death of Jesus. We need to take a good look at ourselves and ask whether we are capable of betraying Jesus. Because, you see, while the betrayal of, by Judas was, in a, a sense, the act of one man, it is still possible to betray Jesus today. And there are still people around who will do that. And there may be different ways to do it. And we need to be careful with a subject like this, that we distinguish between denying Jesus, which Jesus will want to predict uh, in the next verses about Peter, which we're probably uh, well aware of, uh, when he, he simply said, no, I, I didn't know him at all. And there's a distinction between that and the betrayal that uh, Judas is guilty of. Clearly, both Judas and Peter were closely associated with Jesus. But the difference with Judas was that he didn't just deny knowing Jesus, because he was almost like embarrassed and felt awkward about that. But he was actually prepared to hand Jesus over to those who wanted to do away with him and silence him. They hated what Jesus taught, 
what he stood for. They could not accept him as the Son of God with the right to rule their lives. And Jesus, and Judas was prepared to hand Jesus over to them. And there are those around today who want to say, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you have a faith. Those who claim that we shouldn't tell people from other faiths that they need to follow Jesus. And if we actually go along with that, if we effectively say, well, yeah, fair enough, actually, it, it doesn't really matter what we believe as long as you're genuine and sincere about it, who am I to uh, suggest or voice my opinion upon you? If we do that, it's kind of like a betrayal of Jesus. It's like we're saying, you're right, there isn't anything special about Jesus. So that's fine, you go on believing in your particular God. I believe in mine. Or perhaps the more insidious betrayal is by the person who knows that some people find some of the Bible's teaching very out of step with the spirit of our age. They don't like the idea of a God who would care about our sexual ethics, for instance, and they'd like to silence him. Betraying Jesus in those circumstances means going along with them, agreeing that certain views are narrow and restrictive and unenlightened, and that we don't need to take those things seriously. I think this kind of betrayal is to be found in someone who maybe says they would once have called themselves a Christian, but they're now perhaps almost like post-Christian, because their thinking has evolved, and they don't see things in the way that they once would. So they're very happy to sacrifice the truths of the Bible. Now, I don't want us all to panic and question whether we have betrayed Jesus. But it's a chilling thought that just as, Jesus, as Judas took part in the Last Supper without being a true disciple of Jesus, so there will be and have been some who have called themselves Christians, maybe even still do, maybe even take communion, and yet are not truly a follower of Jesus because they haven't submitted their lives to him. And that, let's be clear, as we look in and examine the motives of our hearts, we won't find perfection. We won't find ourselves sold out for Jesus every moment of the day. But we need to ask ourselves, do I really believe that Jesus is the Lord? Do I believe that he is the only way to God? That he is the one who has the right to rule my life? And am I seeking to honour him in the way that I live? Not living perfectly, but recognising that my life does need to be under his control and the lives of everyone else does need that too, that everyone needs Jesus. They may not accept him, but we still believe that he is the only way to God, the only way to eternal life. There's one final thing to take from these verses about the Lord's Supper, and that is that it is a time to look forward. In verse 25, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. To understand better what's behind these words, it helps us to know, as I said earlier, that there were four cups of wine that were passed around during the Passover meal. And what is happening here is probably that Jesus doesn't drink from the fourth cup. We've had the third cup, the cup of redemption. Now it's the fourth cup. And that was the cup of consummation. Because it looked forward to something. And what it's looking forward to is that time once this world has ended, when we will gather in God's presence with all of those whom God has saved from all of history to enjoy a wonderful meal together. It's what Revelation 19 verse 9 calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus doesn't drink from this cup because that is yet to come. The Lord's Supper looks forward to something much greater. We remember that at the moment we live in the midst of a world where many have no time for God, 
In the midst of lives that are full of pressures and problems, pain and sorrow. But it will not always be like this. One day, men and women will be gathered from every nation and tribe and language, and together we will all give thanks in a more perfect way than we ever can here. Give thanks to the God who has loved us so much that he was willing to die for us, so that we could know the overwhelming joy of being in his presence forever. As Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, he knew what lay ahead for him. He knew he'd be tried by the Romans, condemned to death by the Roman governor Pilate. But he knew that this was necessary because he was the only one who could be our substitute. And as the crowd in Mark 15 called for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be crucified, what we have there is an illustration of the more profound substitution that was going to take place on the cross. As Jesus died, not simply so that one man could go free, but so that anyone who trusts in him could be forgiven and set free from the condemnation that our rebellion against him deserves. In the sacrament of communion, God has given us a wonderful visual aid to help us to look back to the cross, to give us the opportunity to look in to our own lives, realize how weak and sinful we are, and also to look forward to what Jesus' death makes possible, as one day we will be with him forever if we are trusting in his death for us. And so as we come to this sacrament, let's take the opportunity it affords. Let's look to the one who sacrificed himself for us to strengthen us, to live for him, to have the courage to stand up and say that Jesus is different and he is the only hope of our world. To say that through his death he did something that no one else could ever have done and that the message of his self-sacrificial death is something that everyone needs to hear, not just for this life, but the even more wonderful life to come. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that what we look back to is your giving of yourself for us. And whether we've been Christians for a short time or for decades, Lord, never do, let us lose that sense of wonder at what you've done for us. Never let us become so complacent about our standing before you that we don't examine our own hearts. And also, Lord, never let us lose sight of that future hope that we have, which is so incredible. May that spur us on and help us to continue to live for you, to, do, to be those who still stand up for you in a world that wants to silence you, doesn't want to listen to you. Father, as we Remember the death of Christ for us. May that strengthen us to live all the more wholeheartedly for you. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing together. When I survey the wondrous cross.
as we've just been reflecting, the sacrament of communion provides us with the opportunity to do three things, to look back to the past, to look also to the present, and to look forward to the future. As we remember the grace of God in giving us forgiveness and salvation, we remember that we don't deserve this and could never earn it. But as we meet around this table, we do so in the present, conscious that as we eat this bread and drink this wine, God is present here by his Spirit among us. And we are declaring that we are the people of God, committed to one another, part of his body, his family in this place. But our thoughts are also directed to that day that Jesus points us forward to, when he will drink the fruit of the vine anew in his Father's glory. A day when we believe that he will join with all God's redeemed people in the marriage supper of the Lamb. With that in mind, we invite you to join with us around the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since it is his table, the bread, the wine, and the invitation to eat and drink are his. And therefore in his name we welcome anyone to join with us who knows Jesus as Saviour and Lord, irrespective of what church he belonged to. St Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that we find the words of institution of this sacrament. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 22, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Just as the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and wine and gave thanks, so now we give thanks to God for what these elements symbolise to us. Let's come to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to this earth with all your power and authority, but whom men opposed and killed because they did not want his rule. And as we think of the death that he died, we marvel that it was all part of your plan. That as he died, Jesus was freely giving his life and taking upon himself your anger at the sin and rebellion that characterizes every human being. We praise you that on the cross, Jesus, who was sinless, became sin for us. Even though he had never done anything wrong in his life, he knew what it was like to be contaminated by the worst excesses of our human natures. We thank you that he was willing to experience utter desolation and abandonment so that we might never need to know what it is like to be cut off from you. As we remember today how the Lord Jesus recognised that the way of the cross was essential and as we marvel at the way he freely gave his body and shed his blood, may we be humbled once again. Father, we recognise that we deserve to be punished for what we have done. But we thank you that we do not have to be because of Christ's death in our place. But as we remember his death this morning, we rejoice in the fact that his death was not the end, and he rose from the grave and ascended to be with you in heaven, where he is making it possible for us to come to you as we do even now, and from where he will return one day as judge and saviour. Father, we pray that as we take this bread and wine, they may be a blessing to us, not only as they remind us of the death of the Lord Jesus for us, but also as they symbolise for us your continuing presence with us and focus our minds on the hope that we have of one day joining in that great feast which you have prepared for all who know and love you. So Lord, we pray you will accept our thanks for your grace and mercy shown to us in the death of your Son and may we once more dedicate ourselves to lives of obedience to you, ready to give our all to you you have given all for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. According to the holy institution, example, and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, 
on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As the elders distribute uh, the bread, we'll hold on to it and then we'll all eat together. Take, eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of him. We eat together to remember Christ's body given for us. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ which is shed for you, this do in remembrance of him.
drink together remembering Christ's blood that was shed for us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember our Saviour's death for us and to celebrate his resurrection. We praise you that we are able to return to you even when we have been errant and wandered far from you. But even today we can make a fresh start with you. Father, even if we have not been so far from you, we need this reminder of your great love for us to spur us on as we try to live for you in the coming week. But we don't know what this week will hold, what challenges there will be for us. But we pray that you will equip us and strengthen and sustain us to live as your people, faithful to you, making what difference we can in the limited spheres of influence that we have, but conscious that you work through your people living faithfully for you. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are in sovereign control of this world. Thank you that nothing that happens in terms of the politics and economics of our country or this world phases you, that you are in sovereign control. Help us to trust you as we look to the future, that our confidence will not be in how clever our politicians can be, but ultimately in you. And our greatest desire of all, Lord, is that more would look to Jesus, would understand who he is, see his beauty, and um, come and bow the knee to him. We pray for that, Lord, in our own land, where there's uh, so much mess and dysfunction in so many areas, and we long that more people would turn to Christ. We pray that for this world as well. Uh, where uh, we see the grip of all sorts of false religions. Um, Lord, we pray that you will shine the light of the gospel uh, and bring more people to trust in you. Lord, thank you that you can be trusted. So we ask, Lord, that you will help us to trust you for ourselves, for our nation, for this world. And give us the strength, we pray, as we go from here, to be the lights that you call us to be for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We finish our service by singing together, O oh, to see the dawn.
may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all evermore.